Is this on? I don't know. Yeah, it's working. Awesome! So, hello everybody. My name's Emperor, and and this is a tutorial on how I made Monolith, which you should have heard. If not, I'll play it for you now, because I'm so kind. Here we go. So that's Monolith. Um, I'm gonna show you how to make it. Uh, yeah, so I'm using FL Studio 9 to produce. Um, 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 I like FL Studio. You should too. It's very good. And I'll start off by saying I limit my master channel. I've got to put that out of the way and confess it right now. But I use Isotope Ozone 4, uh, running the limiter, stereo imager, and the harmonic exciter as well. That's just sort of like a default thing. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is Monolith. It's quite colourful indeed. So I guess I'll just go straight into it and get everything out of the way. Um, let's get this main f section up here. Right, so this is the main section. Uh, it's made up of a drum and a bass and some other bits as well. So I'll just go straight in onto the bass. No, actually the main riff thing. Uh, some of you think it's a muted trumpet, but it's not. It's actually, it's a synth. Can you believe it? So this is what it sounded like without all the stuff on it. So that is just a one a one shot synth, which originally sounded like this. Um. Yeah, so I just dragged that in, pitched it up, sort of altered the quick fade out time of the sample. And you end up with, with that. And then I ran it through a camel fat. Which sort of gives it a bit of fuzz. Not doing much really. Uh, then some reverb, bit of delay, bit of EQ in. And using these doubler plugins as well, which are sort of automated to come in every now and again. Which I'll go into those a bit more in a bit. A bit of reverb again. And then a pitch shifter as well, which comes in later on. <laughs> which sounds cool. And then, yeah, I sort of brought in the bass a bit. <laughs> So I'll take everything off and show you what it sounded like before all of this was put on. Uh, if I can find it. 
Ah, there we go. Sound about it. Just really low, subby. Once again, that's actually a sample. I am a s sort of sample artist. I work exclusively with samples. I don't really use synths that much. I find it quite hard to get rid of a synth sound. Like, for example, if you're using Massive, Massive sounds like Massive, so you can't really get rid of that synthetic digital sound. I love working with samples, stretching them out, you know, that kind of thing. So I did a camel fat on. Uh, sort of just messing around with it, distorting it a bit. And then another camel fat. It doesn't sound very good at this point, but um, yeah. Uh, then a camel space. The camel space is just sort of exciting it a little bit. It's not really doing much. Um, other than sort of bringing it out a little bit more. But then the main thing is the vocodex that I put on it. I'll actually just get rid of everything and bring it back up again. So the vocodex is just sort of making it sound quite resonant. Just sort of gives it a really nice quality. I love doing that. If you run camel fats and then put a vocodex on, or you put modulation on a bass or something, then put it through a vocodex, it'll sound really good. A vocodex is an FL Studio exclusive plugin. So, sorry if you're not using FL Studio. Then a bit of EQ, bring it out a bit more. Bring it the low end a little bit. I also want to mention about the levels on my uh, project files, you may have noticed this already. Because I'm limiting the master, the levels are going mental. So, I, I was always self-taught with everything. I never really looked at tutorials, so I just learned to mix everything off of sound rather than looking at the level readings and stuff. Because essentially they don't really matter. As long as it sounds good, as long as everything's nicely balanced, then it doesn't really matter at all. Some people beg to differ, but that's just my view on it, and that's how I produce, so... Then, a bit of a filler. That's just high-pass filter, just sweeping through. Uh, these are all sort of automated to come in every now and again, throughout the tune. And then a bit of a reverb. That's, once again, that's automated to come in later on. And then, a bit more EQ. That comes in later on in the tune. And then other bits of stuff as well. It's like a pitch shifter. Which is pitching it up an octave. That comes in later on in the tune. I'll show you that. A bit more EQ. Lots of EQ. Sort of get into a habit of putting an effect on and then EQing it again. Because obviously it alters the sound. If you take off the vocodex, it sounds awful. It just sounds like a mess, but with the vocodex, it sounds nice and nice and clean and fresh. Also, I'm coming out the left side of your speaker because my mic's recording in a a mono output, so it's it's not picking the entire thing out. And for some reason, the program I'm using just sort of it doesn't really work properly and this is the only way I can do it so I'm I'm in mono coming out the left side so sorry if I'm a bit quiet so that's the bass with the riff it's very simple this tune's quite simple there's not really much to it but that's really what you want to be doing in your tunes is making it as simple as possible but also making it sound as full as possible you don't want to just be dumping loads of stuff in because it just makes it sound awful. It sounds like a mess, essentially. So now I'll move on to drums. And the kick and the snare. And I just take out the riff and then. So the drums 
are actually from Octane and DLR sample pack. Oh, most of them. <coughs> Got that snare, sort of <coughs> processed it a little bit. I think I pitched it up a bit as well and EQing it. <coughs> which is here. It's just sort of picking out the punchy frequency and then boosting it a little bit. In case you didn't know, that's what a snare sounds like. Um, yeah, the good thing about this EQ in particular is that it gives you a visual representation of the sound. So you can see the peaks in the in the frequencies a bit easier. It's kind of a, a nice little touch. Quite convenient, really. So then we've got a kick drum. My kicks are always punched, like all the way up in the low end but that once again that's just the way I produce it's sort of like everything's cutting each bit out it's sort of it's very messy but <laughs> it's, it doesn't sound very good but yeah just brought out the line of it and then got an EQ on it which comes in later on fill it aside um, yeah so that's that <laughs> I wanted it to be very offbeat, I didn't want it to just be sort of standard, you know, it doesn't sound very tidy. And then hats, <laughs> I say hats, it's not even on, oh, there we go, that sort of comes in later on, then we've got an open hat, that's like sampled from an old vinyl record, EQ'd, so you get a, not, a lot of noise in vinyl records. And then... Uh, yeah, so that's, just, that's essentially drums. It's very simple. There's not really much going on apart from the kick snare and the open hat sample. So... There's a lot of things going on in the background as well, sort of like little effects. Uh, this is this is all just messing around with the time stretching on the samples and stuff. Like I'll clone this and get the original sound. It's just that, but that's pitched up and stretched out. So sort of layered with the bass, just gives it a bit more of an organic texture, which is nice, it's a nice touch. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what I started out with, I just started out with the four bar loop, working out a little pattern, a little riff and whatnot. I'm going to check the chat, see if everything's working properly. Uh, what have we got, what have we got? Uh, wow, there's a lot of people here. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so I'll move on to the intro now. Uh, it started out with a pad sample, which sounded like this. Now that without all the effects on. Everything's resampled, so I can't really get the original sounds and synths up that I used, but it's just layered pad noises and whatnot. And then EQ'd, take out some of those horrible frequencies. And then a doubler as well. The doubler's sort of become my favourite plugin at the moment, because you sort of... It's sort of like an octave effect, but not. It's kind of weird, but... Yeah. That's a nice plugin. Then a stereo enhancer. Just sort of brings out the sound a bit more. Makes it sound a lot larger. <laughs> And then, a bit of reverb really, and then I sort of layered up a few more samples of whooshy effects and whatnot. They're just all samples from Vengeance and stuff just stretched out. 
uh, it's not really much to it, really. I think I picked a bit of a bad tune to talk about because there's not really much going on, but a reverse trance sweep. Which sounds lovely. And yeah. And then some rides going on throughout the tune, some sweeps. Uh, a few more sweeps, a few more effects. Oh yeah, and then this low end sort of pad. Um, and then a break. Uh, I called it June Miller Break Jericho because it sort of reminds me of the the break from their tune Walls of Jericho. A uh, lot of automation going on. This is just filters and reverbs and stuff just being automated. And then a delay percussion sort of noise. Uh, a few other bits and bobs. There's a vocal that goes through the tune as well, which I'll just pick out now. Before we... uh, that's just a. Before we... A ragga sort of vocal with a doubler and a lot of reverb on it. Uh, don't know what it's saying, but fills up the background a little bit. And there's also a background synth going on in the main section as well. It would help if I had it on. <laughs> Once again, that's a sample, but stretched out and manipulated a little bit. Sounded like this originally. Uh, yeah, that's EQ'd, got a bit of reverb on it. Stretched out a bit and cut up, pitched down. And you've got... You got that. Sounds cool. So basically, everything's samples or resampled and stretched and manipulated a bit, just sort of cut up. Very simple. Didn't want to do too much with it, otherwise it would have got quite busy and Yeah. I think that sort of detracts a bit from the atmosphere of a dance tune. You just want it to be very simple, something to dance to. But you also want it to sound good at home for people listening on headphones and stuff, so it's hard to strike a balance, but that's what you gotta do. So I guess I'll move on a bit into the tune. What have we got here? Oh yeah, the bass. I'll go in a bit more about that. Basically this is just the same sample but cloned and messed up a bit more. Uh, and then cut up and rearranged in this playlist window here. I don't really use the step sequencer at all, or this pattern view down here. I just sort of use it, sort of like Logic a little bit. Oh, we've got, got a, just a hi-hat loop going on down there. Sort of gradually bringing in more elements as the tune progresses. Make it a bit interesting. A few switch ups. And then I'll go into this. On the main sort of synth, there's a bit of a harmony play, and I used a pitch shifter on this. Uh, and it's automating down and up. It's basically I've pitched it up to the, the major third so that if you automated it so the mix level of the effects was only about halfway you could hear so I'll just play I'll sort of I'll sort of play it it'll be a lot easier to explain so the sample is just well it's not working Christ just that but pitched up to the third but then in, if you put the mix level halfway it 
plays both the notes at the same time, which is quite cool. <laughs> That's a doubler effect coming in again, just playing the lower octave of the sample. Hmm. Then some synths and stuff. <laughs> Going to this section here. Oh, I've lost it now. I'll just highlight it. So, yeah, just put a filter on the bass. Uh, brought in some more hats. It's sort of like a high string thing going on here. This is using a program, a program, an effect called Gross Beat, which is once again that's an FL Studio plugin. Uh, sort of side chaining the the volume of the string sample in the background. A bit of EQ and a bit of reverb. That sort of comes in there. Um, what else could we go on about? <laughs> this sample here, that's just, um, it's just, uh, just a sample from a sample library. Um, EQ'd a little bit. I'll go into mix, uh, mix downs and stuff a bit later on. I just want to go into the sort of the look of the tune and how I sort of put it all together. Oh yeah, this a little switch up here. But again, that's it's basically just the same samples but rearranged a little bit. And there's this sort of plucky percussive sort of effect going on. Probably just layered samples and stuff. And then get the middle section. This is my favorite part of the tune. Once again referring to earlier how everything's limited so everything's sort of fighting for space. So the snare actually gets cut out on the second drop but it gives it a nice sort of effect. That's the sample. The break even, sorry. Once again, the kick's quite um, pushed up in the low end. And got the snare drum. Sort of exciting those punchy frequencies. And then with the bass, it sort of cuts, cuts out. It's quite weird. <laughs> It's not exactly the best way to mix a tune down, to be honest. But I like the sound of it, really. I mean, people sort of get into this mentality that production is about how clean you can get a mix down or how how much space you can give stuff or how loud it is, but it's not. It's just capturing a vibe and then making sure it all sounds good enough to be played out in a club. Obviously, you've got to EQ and get your levels right and stuff, but approaching production with a mentality of, oh, yeah, the kick needs to be cut at 100 hertz or 
it needs to be pushed up here or whatever. It, it just, just doesn't really make any sense. And then you stop being a producer and you become more of a a surgeon, really. And that's that's not really what it's about. It's about capturing a vibe, making a tune sound different. And whether that's in the mix down or the actual content of the tune, you know? Not everyone can be as good as noisier mix down wise, but that's what sets noisier apart is that they have their own style of mix down, which sounds completely different to say foreign concepts or Eni's or myself's. You know, it's like you just got to find your own sound, really. So there's no really s sort of set formula for a mix down, it's just making sure everything's sounding good essentially this mix down wise there's nothing really going on in this tune it's just sort of eqs and compression maybe the odd bit of compression but everything's already resampled so i don't really have that much going on in this tune it's just like i said just eqing making sure your levels are up and going over zero no ignore that i didn't say that really <laughs> Uh, what else could I go into? There's quite a lot of background hi-hat loops going on. But all this sort of adds to the frothity of the tune. Otherwise, there's not really much going on. I've said this quite a lot. So, what else could we get? Say this now. Um, yeah. Any questions as to what I what you want to know about? All right, what sample libraries are you using? Talk about layering baselines in massive. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, baselines in massive. I never really use massive that much, if at all. I used to use it a little bit. I sort of sort of get my samples up. Uh, what have we got? They're just sort of making these really long samples that you can cut up and do things with. Um, yeah. But for me, Massive's really synthetic and it's more suited for stuff like dubstep and slower genres. I hate the modern talking sound that you can have in drum and bass i just don't think it's very it's very good it just sort of sounds very cheesy so i don't really use massive that much so, uh someone's asked <laughs> i can't follow the chat it's going so fast um basically something about hi-hats and I suppose your question is how to make it sound a bit more fluid or fit together. I suppose it's just sample choice, really. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just come out. I'll just start again. I'll just make a new, a new project file. Let's put Ozone on the master channel. Let's <laughs> limit it for now. Ozone's an amazing plugin, so you should use it, really. So I guess I'll make a break from scratch. Uh, what I usually do is get, I have my own sort of little sample sample library that I go to, which has been built up for quite a long time. But uh, really it's just downloading samples, buying them, um, just making sure your original samples sound good because you can't polish a turd, but you can roll it in glitter. But that doesn't matter. You just got to make sure you've got good samples to begin with. Otherwise, it's just going to sound well not very good. You know, if you're just using Vengeance samples, it'll just sound like Vengeance. You need a bit of a balance. You know, if you're layering hats, excuse me, hats together, you can't just have this going on throughout an entire tune. It'll just sound it just sound a bit rubbish. But you can have that layered with other things. So if I have that sort of in the background. And then you add in 
hi <laughs> hat. Let's find a good one. That's quite nice. Um, I'm using the step sequencer, which I don't usually do, so I'm not very comfortable with it. But I'll just add this in on here. Um, yeah, and then find a good sort of bass drum, really. Bass drum, kick drum. Uh, kick drums are quite weird. Usually you can get enough out of just one sample, but more often than not you'll need to be layering samples together. So you need to find ones which complement each other. So right now I've got one which is just... doesn't sound very good at the moment, but with a bit of EQ, sort of punch up the low end a little bit. So there's not very much not very much high end going on. So if we find one which has got a nice sort of click to it maybe. And then you take that and EQ all the low end out of that kick. It sort of complements it nicely. Um, yeah, and then begin working on snare drums. Snare drums are quite hard because depending on where your samples are and where they're from, they can sound completely different. So once again, just as an example, if you're using vengeance snares, they'll sound quite trancey, but you want to get out of that and just sort of layer them with older snares, maybe vinyl hits, which is what I usually do, sort of sample old records or whatever. Uh, but there's some nice sample packs, like there's a Dogs on Acid one, which is huge actually, it's got all these breaks in it. <laughs> So if you're taking one of these and layering it with, <coughs> excuse me, uh, layering it with your samples, obviously EQ it a little bit. Um, I'll just sort of cut this up a little bit more. So that snare's not really punchy enough, so you might want to add something which has got quite a punchy sort of <laughs> section in it and just sort of EQ that bit. Or whatever. That sort of thing. Obviously this has only been done in like a couple of minutes. You want to spend more time on it, but... So, uh, yeah, that's basically how you sort of build up a break. Some people say that you should start out on a break all the time, but I don't really like that. You sort of start on whatever you feel you want to start out with. You know, you might have a melody in your head or, or there's a certain noise you want to make. It entirely depends. You can't really force a tune either, otherwise it will just sound rubbish. I know this, as most of my attempts at making tunes don't, don't really sound very good. So, that's just a break. Obviously, if you layer that with some basses or sounds or whatever, you might get a nice sort of tune out of that. But, yeah, that's just an example. Consult the chat room for more things. Uh, mm -hmm. Ooh, what have we got here? Cowbell baseline workflow. Is the ozone limit in providing the pump? Yeah, well, it's sort of... You can use it that way. I know people who sort of... sort of bring the threshold on the limiter down by, like, eight, and it sort of that sort of really pushes the sound, but I think it gets to a point where it just sounds too overcompressed. It sort of sounds very... Well, just over compress really. It doesn't sound very good at all. You lose all your dynamics. Already, I'm cutting off quite a lot of the dynamics of the tune by limiting it. So I've sort of got to compensate for that by boosting high end a little bit more here and there with hats, making it a bit more airy. But there's no real 
secret plugin that makes a track punchy or makes it sound a certain way. It's just little parts that build up to make one big sound, really. Also, to get a nice big sounding track, you want to have a really good stereo image on your tune. You can't have stuff just panned in the center and then that's it because there's no real sense of surrounding in it. It just sounds like it's coming from one spot and that's not very good. So it gives the illusion that it's a lot bigger than it actually is. So if I just play this pad, you can see it on the stereo image that it's extremely wide. You've got all this area here that it's covering. Whereas if I didn't have the stereo enhancer on it, you know, it doesn't sound half as big. It sounds very, it sounds quite flat. It takes out a lot of the dynamics as well. So you want to get used to stereo enhancing stuff. Obviously not too much, otherwise it just sounds really strange, but moderation is key. What's a good stereo enhancer? I'm not too sure. I use just the Fruity Loops one. Most of the plugins I use are just the standard Fruity Loops ones, like the reverbs and EQs and stuff. The only three plugins that I'd recommend using are Ozone, Camel Fat 3, and a good EQ. That's, that's essentially it. That's the formula that I base my tunes around. Everything else is within... FL Studio, so let's have a see what else have we got. Where did you get the Perez there? Perez there. Probably from Perez. <laughs> <laughs> Can you show us how to put a decent cowbell in a tune? <sighs> There's no real answer for that, is there? That's a silly question. You should be ashamed of yourself. We use a sample to get your keys. I don't know how. What got me into DMB? Spore got me into DMB. I used to make trance music and stuff, but I gradually moved into drum and bass production. Is all. There's not really much to it. Sub basses, I use the sub bass that's already in the sample. I find that you can't really. Sub bass is a bit of a weird one because sometimes you might want to just get a sine tone and then. If you if you've already got say if I've got this sample going on here, obviously it's already got. If I put an EQ up, you can see the frequencies going on. It's already got this big sort of sub area here. It's already been quite filled up. But say if the sample sounded like this, you're losing out on all your sub bass. So you could back that up with, you know, just a sign. Just going on throughout the entire tune, or playing whenever the thing's playing. It's actually in the wrong key. You know, that sort of thing. But I never really do that. I just use the the sub that's already in the sample, if that makes sense. Like I said, I, I work exclusively with samples. I never really use synths. So, yeah, a lot of the way I work is just sort of bringing in bass samples and then stretching them out and then doing stuff like that. So, for example, once again, I'll close this and open up another thing so I can go into this a bit more. Say if I've got a bass sample, I'll just pick one from a Loop Masters pack. Say, Icicles one. So you've already got this a nice sample to to start off with. Just turn this down a bit. But then what you could do is you could stretch this all the way down. 
or you can keep it the same pitch but stretch it out quite a lot so pitch it down a bit there so it sounds like this it sounds quite facey that um yeah I'll just, I'll just sort of just make a bass now I suppose um and then at this point I just run it through camel fat and if you're feeling uninspired, you can just always just click this randomize button, which is brilliant. I'm just going to pitch this down a bit more. <laughs> you get a lot of stuff like that happening there. However, if I put a vocodex on after this... You end up getting these weird sort of things going on. You get quite a lot of resonance with the Vocodex plugin though, so you want to be taking that out, you know. Like. nice but this is just an example this is what I'd be doing just sort of messing around with that maybe adding bits of other plugins maybe camel space or something but that's pretty much it that's my workflow is just that it's just sort of camel fat and then vocodex messing around with that messing around with samples cutting them up arranging them that sounds awful I'm sorry about that but yeah. Would you consider doing a beginner's guide to a film? Uh. No. <laughs> There's so many tutorials that you can watch that have got. that have got all this on it. Like how. how to make a beat or whatever, or how to do that, you know? It's. It's very easy to just watch a tutorial and then figure it out yourself. I think that's a good mentality to have because then from that you you bring in your own ideas and your own workflows and way of doing things. I know my workflow is completely different to say obtaining DLRs or whatever and it completely depends on the person. There's no set way of making a tune. You know, some people might be disagreeing with a lot of what I'm saying. You know, example especially with like level readings and stuff people are very argumentative about that and samples as well which is a bit weird because essentially drum and bass was built on samples and with samples so essentially that is what drum and bass is it's one of the fundamentals of it so people might disagree with that people might work exclusively with massive or something like that it's all just finding your own workflow, so so no, I will not do one of those. <laughs> Made the one off bass a bit. Yeah, in regards to bass, in this tune, it's a, quite a bad example because there's only one sample going on, but. A lot of people tend to split the bass into different bands, so you might have the you might clone the sample and then have the low end of that sample, the mid range of it, and the high end of it as, as well. But this means you can EQ it separately, so you, you can have the mid louder, the low louder, whatever. But through doing that, it's just sort of EQing sorting out your levels and making sure it just sits well together there's no real way of saying how do you make a bass sit right with a synth because it completely depends on the sound you know I might have uh, this going on that sounds completely different to uh, let's unmute it <laughs> that there's different frequencies going on there's different characteristics of the sound that need to be looked at and eq'd and 
there's no set formula. It's just sort of using your own initiative, if that helps. This is just the way that I've always done it. I've never really looked at, oh, you need to cut a kick at this and then boost it at that and then you bring this in and compress this and compress that. It's There's no set way of doing it. It's all objective and different every time. Punchier snares. Oh, whatever. Everyone's asking for it to be played at 110 BPM, so... I don't know what it sounds like. It'll probably sound awful, but... This is what it sounds like. <laughs> Are you happy? Are you happy now? I'm not. That sounded awful. I'm very angry with you. <laughs> now it's all out of key. You've messed up my live stream. How dare you. Um, yeah. Well, snares. Once again, they're quite objective. Depends on the sound. This one, because it's a sample, it's already been sort of EQ'd, but I EQ'd it a bit more, just made it a bit louder. And in a snare drum, there'll always be a punch within the sample, and you've just got to look for that and bring it out a bit more, depending on how you want the sound to be. You might want it to be a little splashy or a little punchy or something. You know, if you want snares to be a bit splashier you could layer them with layer them with claps or hats or anything like that um it's, it completely depends there's those are little ways of doing it but it's just layering it with other sounds that complement each other it's just sort of using your ears and that's that snares that is snares Favourite keys to write tunes in? Apparently, F sharp or F is a really popular frequency frequency uh, key for drum and bass tunes because the sub sort of, sort of sits well around that area. So F or F sharp. A lot of noisier tunes are in F or F sharp. I'm not sure which one. I'm not going to Outlook, no. Uh, what else have we got? I can't see the chat's moving so fast. By the looks of it, I, I attract quite a lot of silly people. I didn't mean that in a derogatory way. I don't do my kicks in mono. I never really... Well, kicks are always in mono anyway. Let's have a look. Yeah, more or less. You can't really stereo enhance a kick. It sounds awful. The kick's always really been the center of the tune. Same with snares. Uh, most club systems are in mono anyway, so it doesn't really it doesn't really matter about that. <laughs> that sounds awful. Um, let's see what else I could go into. I didn't do the mastering. Uh, the mastering was sent off to Masterpiece Recording. Or oh, Masterpiece Studios, I'm not sure which one it is. But, uh, yeah, they did the mastering, so I can't really comment on that. That's not really my area of expertise. Monolith, I'm not sure. It took me. Let's have a look. Five hours and 22 minutes, apparently. But that's including looking at the, looking at the actual project file and stuff right now. So probably about five hours, I suppose. 
Um, streaming for what else I could go into? Yeah. I suppose I could go into tension a bit. I can't remember what I called it though, so that's a bit pointless. Um, let's have a look. Just going for some questions. Show us a remix. No. There's not really a big difference between the master and the original, no. But it is important that it's done. It is an important... I don't want to be taking that away from the person who mastered it, but... I don't really use buses. I find them quite... confusing, and... I prefer working on each sound individually. Uh... When it comes to buses, I'd, I'd only ever use it if I was, if I had a sidechain compressor on or something. That's the only sort of scenario where I'd use it. Pretty much, yeah. I can't follow this chat. <laughs> um. Yeah, in regards to getting your tunes heard and getting them out, make sure you've got good tunes. Make sure you're confident in your own tunes. Make sure they're different and not just the samey. Or make sure they don't just sound the same as somebody else because that's not that's not going to get you heard by anybody. No one will take notice of you. You need to be your own artist. You need to save someone heard your tune, they, they should be like, oh, that's a such such and such an artist tune, you know? So before you're sending your music out, make sure you have the tunes there to begin with. It might take some time, but you need to have good sounding tunes to start off with to get noticed. And then send your tunes out over AIM or AIM or whatever you'd like to call it this beautiful program down here and then um yeah or email soundcloud dropbox it to labels and people eventually someone will hear it and uh it just sort of snowballs from there really but the main thing is is just having tunes that are a different but at the same time something new Uh, <laughs> Goliath. Oh, that's an old tune. I don't want to look at that. Um. I can't, I'm not allowed to play any unreleased bits, I'm not allowed, I'm under strict orders, otherwise I'll be murdered by men in, in suits, sorry. Ooh, did I just tie the tune up? Uh, a little bit, yeah, my tunes are awfully messy, my tunes are awfully messy. Uh, all over the place. Yeah, it was tidied up a bit. Just a little bit. I don't really name my mixer channels either. So I just sort of look at the visual level reading, say if I want to find out what channel this in. I can see it's these two here. Obviously they're named anyway, but yeah, I'm I'm very messy when it comes to production. I'm not very clean. And very, very unorganized person, so. Let's 
So yeah, I think I've covered mostly everything. But yeah, the main thing is, is just experimenting and finding your own sound rather than basing it off of someone else's. Otherwise, there's no point. Why are you making a tune if it sounds like somebody else? So, uh, do you like me and Diplo? Yes. Yes, I do. So, yeah. I'll go into a few more live streams later on in the week, maybe, about my other tunes. But this one's exclusively about Monolith. So, yeah, I'll post up information on my f Facebook and stuff. So, uh, yeah. I'll go into more detail about that kind of stuff there. Uh, usually I do these live streams quite regularly, actually, so... There's a lot more of me producing and stuff, so... You might learn a bit more from that, but hopefully I've... Hopefully I've covered everything. So, yeah, I don't know how to end it, so I'll just take a few more things. When are your next gigs? I'm playing... Oh yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I'm playing August the 17th at Fabric doing a back-to-back -back set with Meth Juice, which is going to be amazing. So, make sure you're going to see that. CDs. Sorry to disappoint. CDs. Meth Juice. Meth Juice. I I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce it, but check him out. He's sick. I'll do... I'll do another live stream later on with other tunes, but for now, that's everything. I've done an hour, so yeah, if you didn't catch the beginning, it'll be on YouTube and stuff, so you can just go over that, and then, yeah, sorry, it's been a bit messy as well, I haven't really practiced, I've sort of improvised, so... Yeah, like my Facebook and my Twitter, and then and then you can keep up to date with all my activities. Good day to you all. Uh, ask questions in the chat, and I'll answer them in there. So, good day to you all. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.